This is Dr. James Spiegel in his teaching on the philosophy of religion. This is session number seven, The New Atheism. Okay, now that we have looked at a number of um, arguments for the existence of God, reasons uh, to believe in God, um, let's uh, take a look at uh, the opposite view, atheism, and a movement that um, had quite a cultural impact uh, a few years back called uh, the New Atheism. And look at some of the arguments of the New Atheists, and uh, I'm going to offer um, a kind of analysis of atheism that uh, I believe is a, <clears throat> it's a biblical analysis um, and uh, that uh, provides certain considerations that I think should be kept in mind um, by Christians as they contemplate um, this phenomenon of, of atheism. So what is this so-called new atheism? Uh, it's a movement that uh, basically started with the publication of Sam Harris's book, The End of Faith, in 2004. And then there was, in fairly quick succession, a number of other books that were published by people like Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and Daniel Dennett. In fact, those four uh, scholars, Dawkins, Harris, Hitchens and Dennett <coughs> uh, became known as the, the four horsemen of the atheist or the new atheist apocalypse in some quarters. Here's just a sampling of some of the, um, the rhetoric of uh, new atheists, including Richard Dawkins, who is a <coughs> longtime biologist uh, at Oxford. He says the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. So that's his description of God and the, the God delusion. <clears throat> There's uh, Sam Harris, uh, who bears a certain resem resemblance to Ben Stiller in that photograph. He says, when considering the truth of a proposition, one is either engaged in an honest appraisal of the evidence and logical arguments, or one isn't. Religion is one area of our lives where people imagine that some other standard of intellectual integrity applies. That's from his letter to a Christian nation, which is a fascinating book because it's written entirely in the second person. Uh, Harris also says that the men who committed the atrocities of September 11 were certainly not cowards as they were repeatedly described in the Western media, nor were they lunatics in any ordinary sense. They were men of faith, perfect faith as it turns out, and this, it must finally be acknowledged, is a terrible thing to be. Christopher Hitchens <clears throat> says, I suppose that one reason I have always detested religion is its sly tendency to insinuate the idea that the universe is designed with you in mind, or even worse, that there is a divine plan into which one fits whether one knows it or not. This kind of modesty is too arrogant for me. So, there have been atheists from time immemorial, as far back as you know, we can uh, explore historically. There have always been religious skeptics, agnostics, and atheists. What is unique about what we're calling the new atheism, that <clears throat> the brand of atheism that we get from the likes of uh, Hitchens and Harris and Dawkins and Dennett? How do the new atheists differ from the old or traditional atheists, your grandmother's atheists? One, I think, uh, is um, just a difference in attitude. There's 
a much more brazen and uh, aggressive approach than, say, you find in the works of a David Hume, John Dewey, or Bertrand Russell. Maybe they're more like uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, who was very aggressive uh, and harsh in his condemnation of theism. And there's a certain, at least purported, scientific emphasis that you find in the New Atheists. They tend to insist on, um, on you know, a scientific justification for religious belief. And failing that, uh, you are irresponsible in believing in God, according to the, the New Atheists. So their primary objections, when you, when you really uh, read them closely, uh, there, there are two main objections that uh, seem to be, uh, that seem to prevail in their works. One is uh, the old problem of evil. Um, how could an all-powerful, perfectly good God allow evil? Um, <clears throat> we will discuss that in a, in a separate lecture. Um, but that is a, it's a main concern in the uh, inquiry into religious belief generally, and it does constitute a problem for the theist. Uh, we can grant that <clears throat> for sure. The new atheists, though, uh, assume consistently that this problem cannot be solved, it can't be answered adequately. So that would be one of the primary reasons for their atheism. <clears throat> the other is an objection from science, uh, that belief in God and specifically doctrines like the virgin birth of Christ, uh, the resurrection of Jesus, the divine inspiration of the Bible, and uh, various miracles in scripture, that these things cannot be verified or explained scientifically. They're anti-science. And so if you're a person who's uh, rigorously rational, you should reject all of those doctrines all of those beliefs, that's a consistent theme in the New Atheist as well. How do we respond to the objection from science? <clears throat> we will talk about this in more detail in a separate lecture, but I can note right now that to insist that all of one's beliefs be scientifically based or subject to confirmation through empirical inquiry is what is sometimes called scientism or positivism. The problem with positivism or scientism is that it's self-refuting. This demand that all truths be scientifically provable is something that itself cannot be scientifically proven. So it's self-refuting, it saws off the limb on which it's seated, um, it undermines itself, however you want to put it. Um, it's certainly not a claim or a view that can be maintained consistently. Secondly, scientism or positivism rules out the possibility of knowledge of such things as moral truths, uh, knowledge about beauty or even the meaning of life. You can't get any of that from science. Science is an empirical uh, uh, means of inquiry and uh, it gives us accurate and very useful uh, factual descriptions of the world but it is completely blind to values and beauty and ultimate meaning in life so um, anyone who insisted on scientism uh, would have to surrender all of their beliefs about all of those things, which is a bit scary because such a person would have to um, be a complete moral skeptic and say we don't have any moral knowledge. And such a, pers a person would be a bit scary to be around, really. <laughs> um, usually the, well, maybe always, at least every uh, time I've seen a, a one of the new atheists deal with this question. They insist that, oh no, we know that there are moral truths. Um, we know that you know, certain things are right, certain things are wrong, and that you know, justice, uh, just treatment of others and 
uh, respect for people, those things are good. So they, <clears throat> they affirm these moral values and, and presumably strive to live accordingly. Uh, but the point is that if they really are devotees of scientism or positivism, then they can't consistently um, affirm moral truths and, and uh, values. <clears throat> it's just something that that, um, that perspective has no room for. Um, science itself is based on uh, certain unprovable articles of faith. I think this is an important observation to, to make uh, here as well, is that for all of the emphasis that one might place on science um, and <clears throat> the need to be scientifically rigorous about all sorts of uh, issues, science itself is founded on faith commitments like our belief that our senses are generally reliable, that, that effects have causes, uh, that nature is uniform, that thought reflects reality. These are all things that can't be proven scientifically. They must be assumed from the outset. So again, if someone's a positivist or um, <clears throat> affirms scientism, there's another inconsistency there because um, science cannot prove any of those things but must assume them as basic philosophical articles of faith. Here's another thing we can note uh, in response to the new atheism is that there actually is overwhelming evidence for God and a lot of it does come from science um, as well as from uh, morality or common sense beliefs about ethics and right and wrong as well as uh, personal experience. And many leading Christian apologists from C.S. Lewis to Lee Strobel who once were atheists, um, they were converted uh, in large part through an exploration and inquiry into the evidences for faith in the existence of God. <clears throat> a recent um, dramatic example of this is uh, Anthony Flew, who was uh, a leading atheist intellectual um, for better part of 50 years, um, beginning in the 50s and 60s. Uh, he produced a number of scholarly works that had a huge influence in philosophy of religion and really put theists, Christians and other theists, on the defensive and, you know, really gave them the burden of proof. He insisted that we should begin with a presumption of atheism and it's the responsibility of the theist to prove the existence of God. Otherwise, the theist has no rational right, uh, no epistemic right, to believe in God. Okay? Their duty is to demonstrate, prove that God exists, and then and only then um, would they be satisfying their epistemic obligations and in, in being a religious believer. So flu is a huge part of creating that atmosphere in the academy and especially in the philosophical guild this presumption of atheism. But something happened <laughs> um, around 2004 or 5. <clears throat> he became a theist of sorts, um, not an Orthodox Christian, um, certainly someone who, who believed that the universe had to have been caused by a supernatural being. Um, and uh, when this when the news broke about this, and I think it was about 2005, um, it was an international story. And uh, he subsequently wrote a book called There Is a God. And uh, there he recounts um, the sorts of considerations that prompted his con conversion to a, a kind of theistic perspective. <clears throat> One is just thinking more deeply and in light of emerging evidence um, related to cosmology, the existence of the cosmos and the need 
for the universe to have a causal explanation um, and cosmic fine-tuning, which we've talked about uh, over the decades as uh, more and more uh, uh, information has been uh, gathered with regard to just how finely tuned the various laws of nature are um, to allow for the, the possibility of life in the universe. It's this exquisite <coughs> convergence um, among all these different laws of nature for the possibility of life. It really looks like the universe has been designed for that possibility. That had an impact on flu as well. And then <coughs> the, um, the emergence of life. How do we explain the origin of life from non-living inert matter? That's always been a challenge for atheists. Um, but uh, <coughs> for flu, you know, more and more inquiry into just how problematic that is uh, from the perspective of a naturalist that too had a, a major impact. So uh, he finally um, converted to a kind of theism and when he wrote his book, There is a God, uh, <clears throat> who did he ask to write a kind of appendix regarding you know, Christianity? Was, uh, it was uh, N.T. Wright, the great uh, New Testament scholar, which I think that really reflected the depth of Flew's respect for N.T. Wright and um, the significant uh, possibility, if not likelihood, that if some particular um, brand of theism in terms of a religious tradition with a, a history of you know, alleged spe special revelations from God, if one of them is true, that uh, it's most likely Christianity, and, and Flew said that uh, because of <clears throat> the charisma of Jesus of Nazareth, um, the nature of his uh, discourses, as well as the, uh, the scholarly genius of the Apostle Paul, both of those things um, made it such that to his mind, to Flew's mind, if one of these theistic traditions is true, it's most likely Christianity. I don't know if he ever came to a full-fledged uh, Christian belief, but there, there were certainly indicators that he was um, sympathetic with the idea that, 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 that uh, Christianity might be the true or truest form of theism in terms of major religious traditions. So uh, we've talked about evidence for God and different theistic arguments. Um, if theism really does have strong evidential support and atheism is fundamentally irrational, therefore, then people don't become atheists because of the evidence. Uh, so the question is, what is the cause of atheism? When, when the new atheist movement was really uh, taking off, um, I kept expecting someone to uh, write a book which kind of clarified what the, the biblical explanation for atheism is, and it's not just a, a problem with the evidence, but each book that came out kind of dealt with the evidence for God and didn't address a primary, maybe the primary biblical analysis of atheism, so I thought, well, Somebody's got to write the book. Nobody else is doing it, so I'll, I'll do it. And uh, so my book uh, called The Making of an Atheist uh, was published in 2010. And here's kind of a summary of some of the main ideas that I develop in that book. Um, what I'm looking for is simply a biblical explanation or account of atheism. And here are some key biblical texts which uh, provide for us what um, seems to be going on when, uh, when people become at least hardcore atheists. Uh, we're not talking about people who just have doubts or even agnostics. 
uh, or people who are undecided, but people who are convinced and even dogmatic atheists like uh, Dennett, Dawkins, Harris, and Hitchens. So Romans 1 uh, deals with this issue in a very straightforward way. The Apostle Paul writing says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth of their, uh, by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So Paul is, is telling us there that God has made himself plainly known in creation. You have no excuse not to be a theist. And it's a kind of hardening or suppression of truth by, by vice, or what he's calling wickedness, that prevents certain people from acknowledging the reality of God. In Ephesians 4, he says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Again, you have this theme of ignorance about God due not to lack of evidence, but because of a kind of hardening of the heart. There's a, there's a certain... Uh, resistance of the will to the truth of God. And then in John 3, and this is Jesus talking, he says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So again, the theme of resistance to the truth, Jesus uses this metaphor of light, um, because of a person's particular disposition. It's a, it's a willful resistance <clears throat> and rejection. It's not for lack of evidence or even ambiguity of evidence. So the upshot here is that unbelief, uh, when it comes to the reality of God, is a consequence of disobedience. Um, and in one of the chapters in my book, I, I lean heavily upon the work of Alvin Plantinga and his Reformed Epistemology, which we'll talk about separately. Um, he has a chapter in the third volume of his great trilogy on Warrant. Uh, the book being called, uh, the third volume is called Warranted Christian Belief. He has a chapter there on the cognitive consequences of sin. Um, human cognition was designed to function in a certain way, just like you know, our various organ systems um, and when there are inimical factors that compromise the proper function of our cognition, then we're, we're less reliable in, the, in terms of the formation of true beliefs. <clears throat> and so one of the things that compromises cognitive function, planning and notes, in addition to um, you know, things like, uh, say, mind-altering drugs or, you know, large amounts of alcohol or, um, you know, physical brain damage or bad philosophy, uh, that can compromise cognitive function on all, all sorts of issues. Um, <clears throat> another factor that compromises cognitive function is sin, immorality, vice. Uh, can corrupt the way we think about all, all sorts of issues, especially moral and spiritual issues. So if sin corrupts us cognitively, um, it compromises our cognitive function. It damages what John Calvin is called, and Calvin Plantinga uses this term as well, 
the sensus divinitatis, which is a natural, divinely endowed, innate awareness of God. Sin damages or compromises uh, our ability to perceive what really is clear evidence of God, as the Apostle Paul says. God's in invisible qualities, his eternal power, his, his divine nature are evident from what has been made so that no one has an excuse. Um, but uh, as we give ourselves over to certain sins, I would say especially the sin of pride, abject pride. I think that is a sin that we all struggle with. And in the case of uh, hardcore atheists, uh, dogmatic atheists, um, there is a kind of succumbing to the, the, the temptations of pride in that case. And then other things as well, de depending on the person, uh, the, the, the kinds of um, sins that they might give themselves over to that might create that kind of cognitive block in terms of belief in God. So there are cognitive consequences of sin. It's planning a notes. In my book, I, I discuss this at length. Uh, there's a positive side here, though, in terms of uh, the impact of behavior and lifestyle um, on belief formation and cognitive function. And that is that obedience enhances cognition and therefore our moral spiritual awareness. And there's an indication of this in a number of passages in the Proverbs and the, the, the wisdom literature you know, that God grants wisdom and understanding and insight to those who are humble and, and uh, voluntarily submit themselves to the Lord. Um, a person who has relatively little education can, can actually become very wise um, <clears throat> as they submit themselves to God and obey uh, his word. Um, in the book of John, chapter 7, I think we also have a confirmation of this idea. Again, this is Jesus speaking. He says, if anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own, which is a, an interesting uh, um, kind of promise here because it, it reverses the way we normally think about it, where I'm going to do inquiry Right, I'm going to investigate this, particularly those of us who are academics, you know, who are going to do kind of rigorous analysis, and then once I can be sure that it's true, then I will live accordingly. Well, Jesus is saying, um, trust me, do God's will, and then you will get a kind of greater insight and enlightenment, in this case regarding um, his own identity and whether he... Uh, um, he speaks for God. In my book, I discuss a number of um, considerations from other fields, including psychology, uh, that confirm this thesis that uh, specifically that, uh, that the personal vice compromises are uh, proper function in our thinking about God, but more generally just the impact that behavior has upon belief. Um, Paul Witts, who's a, a former atheist who came to, to believe in God after many decades, he wrote a book called The Faith of the Fatherless. And in that book, he, um, he actually follows the lead of some influential uh, atheist scholars and Ludwig Feuerbach and Sigmund Freud who uh, attempted to psychologically explain away religious belief. And what Witz does in his book, The Faith of the Fatherless, is he <laughs> does a kind of psychological uh, explaining away of atheism. He, he gives a psychological account for why it is that some people become atheists, which Looking at it um, just from a statistical standpoint, uh, make of this what you will, but 
they're anywhere from, you know, maybe five to eight percent of the population is atheist, uh, depending on the, the polls you read. So that's a small percentage of the population that's atheist. Um, and the great majority of humanity has always been, you know, believers in some sort of higher power. Um, so here you have the, the atheists that are, are trying to explain away the, you know, the beliefs of 90% plus of the population regarding God as somehow um, failing cognitively in a severe way. I mean, we're talking about uh, the most important issue of them all in philosophy. Is there a God? And to have over 90% of the population fundamentally deluded about that, that's a, that's a very disturbing and, and dark view of the human condition. Whereas, it just from a statistical standpoint, if, if you think that human beings are you know, at least um, decently uh, adjusted to the nature of reality, um, then probably the, the great majority, it's more likely the great majority have it approximately right when it comes to uh, the God question. It's only, you know, uh, less than 10% of humanity that has this so fundamentally wrong. At least that's a less pessimistic view. Um, if it's only a small minority of the population that's so misguided on this question. But Paul Witts offers a, a kind of psychological account for how it is that that you know five to ten percent of the population ends up um, atheistic it's his defective father hypothesis um, that atheism is precipitated by a broken relationship with one's father he comes to this conclusion or he, at least he develops this hypothesis on the basis of a historical analysis of all of the major atheists in the modern period forward into the 20th century, and every one of them, you know, from David Hume to Freud, Bertrand Russell, Dewey, Nietzsche, every one of them, Marx, they had a severely uh, broken relationship with their father. Either the, the father died, the father left the family, or was extremely abusive. So there's a consistent theme there, which is very suggestive. Meanwhile, he looks at the major theist, influential theistic thinkers in the period, and, and all of them had, if not a decent relationship with their father, there was a significant father figure in their life um, and uh, who was a kind of positive influence on them. Now, I hasten to add that there are plenty of people who are strong theists and Christians who have had severely broken father relationships. Um, and that's consistent with Witz's thesis. He's not saying it's a sufficient condition for atheism. Maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a necessary condition. So plenty of people, devoutly religious, Christian and otherwise, have had broken father relationships. And they have just not responded in the way that uh, um, the hardcore atheists do. So it's still a choice that a person makes, whether they're going to um, maintain a kind of atheistic uh, orientation or be bitter, I would say, bitter towards the God that in, the, in the, their heart of hearts they know is there. Um, and you might say, give God the silent treatment. Some have kind of presented it in those terms. And, maintain that everybody knows in their heart of hearts there's a God and plenty of former atheists will, would say that. I would say that. I was a kind of agnostic for a while, but I knew even when I would call myself agnostic, I knew all along there was a God uh, and that I was resisting that God and his call on my life. <clears throat> um, Paul Johnson's book, Intellectuals, it's a fascinating uh, examination of many leading modern intellectuals who uh, uh, really use their scholarly inquiry and um, theories uh, 
to kind of rationalize or justify or minimize their own personal debauchery. E. Michael Jones's book, Degenerate Moderns, is kind of does the same thing in a uh, fascinating and disturbing way. And he looks in particular at scholars like Margaret Mead, Alfred Kinsey, the certain members of the Bloomsbury group who developed their theories, again, as kind of in so many ways rationalizations of their, um, their own lifestyles, which were anything but uh, Christian. And then William James's Will to Believe, <clears throat> uh, I talk about that in the book as well, which we've already talked about in another lecture, how the will often plays a significant role in belief formation. And psychological studies have, have confirmed this, um, that uh, when there's a conflict between a belief and one's behavior, uh, the most likely thing to give way is actually the belief, to conform to the behavior. We might naively think that, well, when, when there's a kind of cognitive dissonance there, a person will just change their behavior to conform to their beliefs. Well, in many contexts, that certainly is the case. But in moral contexts, uh, particularly when there's a lifestyle choice here that's contradicted by certain uh, beliefs that one might hold, it's a lot easier to just change your convictions um, or say, well, I've looked into it a bit more and my mind has changed on that. And I don't think that's wrong after all. So that's why I you know, still live, say, a sexually promiscuous life. Uh, I don't think it's really wrong so long as I'm treating these people uh, respectfully along the way. It's a lot easier to change your beliefs than your behavior um, the philosophy of science of, of Thomas Kuhn um, is also relevant here. Um, Kuhn <coughs> maintained that um, a, a person's theoretical commitments, the, the theoretical paradigm <coughs> that they subscribe to in a context of you know, science, scientific inquiry, that has an effect on the way that they uh, interpret the data and how they analyze it and the, and the inferences that they make <coughs> regarding the data. A person's you know, standing uh, belief commitments, and theoretical affirmations um, impact how they interpret the data. So this is all a part of what Kuhn calls the theory-ladenness of uh, scientific observation. Well, this is true not just in a context of science, but in so many other life contexts. When we have a theoretical uh, commitment in place, we tend to see the world in those terms. Take you know, a geocentrist and a heliocentrist, uh, for example. The, the geocentrist <coughs> believes that that this, this, the sun revolves around the earth. They go outside and they see the sun orbiting the earth, right? That's what it looks like to the geocentrist because that's the belief system they have in place as, uh, as geocentrists. Meanwhile, a heliocentrist goes outside and sees the, the same thing, the sun going from east to west uh, throughout the day, every day. And they would say, well, I am indirectly observing the rotation of the earth that creates this impression of the sun traveling around the earth, right? So the geocentrist and the heliocentrist are observing, you might say, the same thing, but <clears throat> each is observing it through a theoretical framework that impacts at a fundamental level exactly how they are uh, interpreting the data. Well, that's just kind of a basic illustration of uh, what goes on in so many other contexts as we interpret the data of human experience through the theor theoretical lenses that we have in place. And if you have an atheistic framework, <coughs> um, you get locked into that, <coughs> 
then uh, even what should be clear evidences for God um, are, you know, they, they, they don't have an impact. They, they're interpreted uh, naturalistically um, so that we have this consequence that, that the Apostle Paul talks about in Romans 1, a kind of suppression of the truth and <clears throat> it, a preserving of this ignorance of God um, though he is displaying himself in nature in all sorts of uh, vivid ways in terms of um, the plants and animals that we see around us, just the fact of the cosmos, all these different galaxies, and the fine-tuning of the universe, and all these things we've, we've, we've already talked about. Um, they don't make an impact because <clears throat> of what I call paradigm-induced blindness. Um, I also talk about self-deception. When there's a motivated bias to believe something that is false, um, <clears throat> even when there's clear evidence that, that contradicts a person's beliefs, um, <clears throat> they may still persist in that belief, like in the case of A.J. Ayer, who had a near-death experience. He was he was eating, I think, uh, some salmon, um, and uh, it, it got caught in his windpipe. He passed out, and uh, <clears throat> eventually he was, he was brought back to consciousness, and he reported experiencing some things that were supernatural. Um, <clears throat> and he later confided to his, his uh, family physician with dismay that, now I'm going to have to change all of my books, right? Because he had been writing from a, a logical positivist perspective all these decades. But evidently he decided against that because, you know, he never recanted. Unlike Anthony Flew would later do, A.J. Ayer never publicly confessed his belief in the supernatural. Um, so he had a motivated bias because he wanted to maintain a certain, I guess, scholarly integrity at least not to come out publicly um, as someone who was a, I don't know if he ever became a theist, but um, he did write uh, a little essay, um, I can say this for him, called What I Saw When I Was Dead, where he reports this, um, but uh, based on other reports that have come out with regard to conversations he had with his, his family physician, um, this was actually far more impactful with regard to his recognizing um, the significance of this for belief in the supernatural than he ever let on publicly. Anyway, that would be a, certainly a motivated bias for a lot of scholars who are atheistic or religious skeptics, as well as just ordinary folks who, uh, who persist in their, their atheistic perspective for um, reasons of, that are uh, more, uh, more personal than, than logical. And then finally, uh, in my book I talk about the the blessings of theism and how uh, theistic belief um, provides motivation for, for virtue. It improves our cognitive health. If you're, the, the more attuned you are to the reality of God, the, the, the more um, obedient you will be. Um, and the more obedient you are, then the more attuned you will be to the reality of God. It's kind of virtuous cycle there. Um, so uh, our obedience and faithful living improves our cognitive function. And then uh, another benefit of theism is it provides for us a, the right to complain as well as the privilege to thank, both of which are psychologically beneficial. 
to have someone to complain to, like the psalmists do over and over and over again. A lot of biblical <coughs> writers and characters complain to God about so many things, and this is a right and good thing to do, so long as it's done respectfully. Um, <coughs> an earnest complaint to God, why have, have you subjected us to this injustice and suffering, and how long, O oh Lord, you know, uh, before uh, you save us. That is a um, cathartic kind of um, thing to do, and it's, it's, it's very psychologically beneficial, as is the uh, ability to, to thank someone who is responsible for the universe and all its beauty, all of the <clears throat> many blessings that we have, um, from art to technology to just plants and animals and the beauty of nature. We have someone to thank for all those things. I know an atheist would say, well, we can thank those who invented, you know, air conditioning and the, the toaster oven. That's not the depth of gratitude or thanks that the, the theist has an opportunity for in terms of um, thanking the God who endowed human beings with rational capacities to come up with, with uh, these sorts of technologies. But certainly when it comes to <clears throat> nature and um, you know, the beauty that we observe all around us um, or the, the things that we discover about the human body and how remarkably designed it is we theists do have someone to thank, our creator, who made us this way and gave us these abilities. Um, <clears throat> if you believe that we are the result of eons of natural selection and uh, you know, genetic mutations, and that's it, you know, in a naturalistic universe, you really have no one to thank <clears throat> for you know, our remarkable human bodies as well as all of the, the beautiful creatures, um, flora and fauna in, in creation. So those are some of the, some of the uh, benefits of theism. <coughs> and that's how I conclude my book on a kind of positive note there. So those are my thoughts on the, uh, the new atheism. This is Dr. James Spiegel in his teaching on the philosophy of religion. This is session number seven, The New Atheism.